Today in Britain, the cost of energy is rising. Energy intensive industry is moving overseas. The elderly and low waged struggle to pay their bills and heat their homes. The risk of power cuts is increasing. The government's search for an end to these problems is growing ever more desperate. But there is a solution to all these problems, and it's right beneath our feet. It's called shale gas, and earth scientists say there may be vast amounts of it under the ground and under the sea throughout the British Isles. From the northwest to the southeast, surveys reveal deposits that could be the next North Sea and help the UK repeat some of the success that America has seen in its own shale gas revolution. So why aren't we drilling here now? Two minor earth tremors were linked to exploratory fracking operations in Lancashire. Anti-fracking campaigners called the tremors earthquakes, and this became one of the most powerful and persistent myths in debates about fracking. But there were no earthquakes. They were tremors, and you would barely notice them. Seismologists tell us that those terrible earthquakes in Lancashire were no greater than the effects of a train passing 150 metres away. But it was enough to stop fracking here in the UK. To allay public anxiety generated by activist propaganda, the government created a moratorium on test drilling. But the tremors linked to fracking were certainly no worse than the seismic events triggered by other underground activities, such as mining or eco-friendly renewables like hydroelectric or geothermal. The unscientific claim that these tremors were unprecedented, could cause damage and even lead to bigger earthquakes, was used in the campaign against fracking to slow its progress. And that is how the anti-fracking campaign continued after the moratorium was lifted. But rather than creating panic about earthquakes, activists now spread alarm about the stuff our lives depend on. We'll mess up our landscape, we'll have contaminated our water, our aquifers. If you contaminate an aquifer, you can't clean it. We've got to stop this. This is just short-sighted insanity. Unpolluted water is essential for life and for fracking. Each fracking well pumps water at high pressure into the well to allow the gas released from the rock to flow back through the well shaft to the surface. But shale gas extraction on an industrial scale warned campaigners, would use up so much water that there would be very little left for human consumption. It would create water stress, they said. A thousand fracking wells would consume 10 million cubic metres of water. That's the same as we use across the UK to make soft drinks every year. Put another way, that's about 166 litres of water per person in the UK. The same as you'd use for a nice, hot, deep bath. That doesn't sound very scary to me. Once we put the numbers into perspective, alarmist stories about water stress cease to have any power. But another anti-fracking scare story is not so easy to dilute. The contamination of the water supply with toxic substances. I'm off to the supermarket to buy all the ingredients you need to make deadly fracking fluid. According to anti-fracking campaigners, there are many hundreds of secret chemical ingredients used in fracking, many of which cause cancer. Yep. But it turns out that these allegedly dangerous substances can be found in the supermarket. So I've been to the supermarket and I've got my deadly fracking ingredients. And as you can see, most of these items are ones we commonly use around the home. Citric acid, which you find in citrus fruits. We have isopropanol, which is found in hand sanitizing gel. Gua, which is a stabilizing agent commonly used in ice cream. Borate or borax, which you find in eye wash. Ethylene 
glycol, better known to you and me as de-icer. Ammonium persulfate, which you use to dye your hair. Ammonium bisulfate, which is the caramel colouring you find in cola drinks. Sodium carbonate, which you find in soap. Ordinary biocide, germ killer. Now there are two more of these deadly secret ingredients that I didn't get from the supermarket. And the reason I didn't need to get them from the supermarket is because they were already here in my stomach in the form of gastric acid. Almost all of these chemicals have everyday household uses. Some of them we put onto our bodies and some of them we even put into our bodies without suffering any ill effects. There is nothing secret about the chemicals used by the UK shale gas industry, but it suits political activists to pretend there is because it sounds more scary. However, it's not just the stuff that goes into fracking wells that worries environmentalists. It's the stuff that comes back out, including gas. Because we don't want fracking fluid chemicals that are toxic in our nature. Additionally, you will have released radioactive materials and other heavy metals. While fracking for man, tier and umwelt hohe Risiken birgt. Anti-fracking campaigners complain that this may escape into groundwater sources through damaged well casing or by being improperly stored above the surface. But that's what our water looked like. That came out of, just out of the tap? Out, out of, of the, the tap. tap. Right. Less than 1% of homes in England and Wales have private water supplies. But dramatic footage of dirty oh, water man. and of people setting light to their tap water energised the UK's anti-fracking movement. Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. This isn't a serious documentary. This is classic Michael Moore-style agit prop. There's a point where resistance becomes duty when they're going to come and, you know, poison people's families, and peer-reviewed science shows that this happens. And my family lives 750 metres away from this site. I'm not having them poisoning my parents. Protesters who set up camp in Balcom claimed that they were only trying to protect local water supplies. Yet water provided to Balcom's population is supplied from the River Ouse, not from the ground. There was no possibility that people in Sussex were going to have blue flames and dirty water shooting out of their taps. But the campaign against fracking capitalised on this misinformation nonetheless. And it seems obviously possible, almost inevitable, that in a country where more than 80,000 wells have been fracked, you would expect to have seen at least one aquifer being contaminated by fracking. But in spite of all the stories, anti-fracking campaigners in the US have struggled to show any scientific evidence of contamination of water by fracking. Public health and environmental agencies routinely report that there is no link between fracking and the events attributed to it. Even nature can contaminate water supplies. Gas naturally appears in water in many places around the world, even where there is no fracking. And it can be a problem in areas where people rely on private water supplies. But luckily it's a problem that people have been dealing with for many years. If there's gas in your water that you want to get rid of, just shake it up and vent it. But don't expect films like Gasland to explain that gas in water can be easily removed. The anti-shale campaign depends on dramatic images like these to frighten people. All ways of producing power, including green or renewable energy, involve risk. But environmental activists take risks out of context to terrify people about the ground beneath their feet, the water that comes out of their tap, the air they and their children breathe. Discussions at local level on the very few sites of experimental rigs has been distorted by groundless scare stories. Large green organisations have funded and supported protesters who have come from all over the country to hold up development at experimental fracking sites through disruptive and sometimes violent protest requiring expensive policing operations. The government isn't listening. 
changes, the greatest threat that we face. So there's Green MP Caroline Lucas using what she calls the democratic process to deny the people of Britain cheap energy. Thanks, Caroline. Now, looking around, we can see some of the tents that have been set up, a whole lot of tents. There's a, a tranquility tent over there moving around. There's even an area for the, the kids that has been set up. Certainly, it's very well organised here. These protests have been covered in the media as though they were holiday camps with special celebrity guests. Fearful of the public mood, politicians, scientists, even energy companies have been too cowed to make a positive argument for shale gas. Politicians love to sing the praises of ugly, inefficient, expensive, renewable energy. But when they talk about the shale gas miracle beneath our feet, they sound almost embarrassed. The shale gas industry too seems oddly reluctant to stick up for itself. Rather than trying to combat green scaremongering, it often seems to indulge it, or even endorse it. Worst of all, though, has been the capitulation to the green movement by our political class. We seem to have a plan with that. We have targets. We have climate change records recognised by statutes. But even that climate act is not adequate. The House of Lords, the House of Commons, select committees, entire government departments, armies of civil servants, all have proved utterly helpless to resist the blandishments of quangos, renewable energy lobbyists and green activist organisations. A dash for gas instead of the renewables we so desperately need and to set some kind of example for the rest of the world too. The opportunities for shale gas in the UK were first spotted years ago, but Westminster's priorities were elsewhere. Now politicians at last claim to support fracking, but only on the basis that it can lead to a greener energy market. Will this greenwashing be enough to overcome the organised resistance to shale? Will it counter the scare stories and provide a secure environment for investment and exploration? Even if there was a positive attitude to shale in Westminster, bigger problems at the European level exist. It wasn't until January this year that the EU decided that it would not regulate fracking. With France having lobbied for an EU-wide ban, and with EU-funded NGOs campaigning for the same, it's no wonder that fracking in the UK is only an early experiment. And it may only remain an experiment. Who would want to invest here? Green organisations with the support of the EU and government have poisoned the public mood against shale gas. I'm on the roof of Greenpeace's headquarters in London. Come and have a look at their solar panels. Got some people from Greenpeace here to help show me around. Groups that the Prime Minister has encouraged now threaten to obstruct shale gas on the street, in the fields and in the courts. Britain's energy infrastructure has been paralysed by waves of neglectful, incoherent, opportunistic policymaking of a form of politics which is completely indifferent to the needs of ordinary people and businesses. That is why we are not fracking in the UK and why there may not be any substantial shale gas produced in the UK. Which is pretty bizarre when you know the facts about fracking. It's as if we've just won the lottery but instead of collecting our winnings and enjoying the proceeds, we've decided it would be better to rip up our ticket and carry on as we were before, in misery and penury. It's time we asked ourselves a simple question. Do we want cheap, safe, abundant energy or not? <laughs>